Well, our special guest is more like family to us because this is the third time we have invited Taylor to be our guest speaker. Now, why would I invite somebody three times? Well, basically, because you've demanded that I do. He is such a gifted communicator. First time Taylor spoke here, we were out of town. I came back and everybody's like, wow, who was that guy? And that's the kind of reaction I just love to hear. Because I want you enthused when you get to hear a fresh voice and a new perspective and Taylor brings it. I mean, he brings it and he's going to bring it again today. Give a Cal Church welcome to Taylor, who's back with the family at Cal Church. Well, hey, Cal Church, what is up, man? Thanks, Pastor Brad. That is some very kind words. Um, and it really does feel like family. You know, I'm like that creepy cousin or that weird uncle, you know, that shows up every couple months. Uh, but man, I just love getting to partner together. Uh, and if we've never met before, my name is Taylor. Um, and it's so good, uh, whether you're tuning in online or here in the room, uh, to be together this morning. And I just love that Cow Church's mission, you know, is to introduce people to Jesus and to help them follow him. Like, I love that this is the kind of place where we can all come together, you know, heroes and zeros, you know, anyone and everyone, the down and out, the broken, the up and to the right, the moral elites, the moral failures, and the moral police. Like, we can all come together, and man, we can hear about the hope that we have uh, in Jesus. And I don't know if you know this, but Easter is just a couple weeks away. Um, anybody already getting ready, like Easter preparations? Um, you know, maybe you're starting. If you haven't already, you're going to in the next couple weeks. You're going to start going shopping, you know, for Easter baskets, Easter gifts, starting to break out the Easter eggs, you know, polish them up. Uh, maybe you're going to go look for Easter outfits for you and your family to wear together. You know, Target has a great amount of them where you and your kids can be matching, you and your spouse can be matching, even you and your dog can be matching if you want to this Easter. Um, parents are going to start, you know, preparing their kids that it is time to go take a picture with the Easter bunny, and you might need to prepare your kids because they might be afraid of the bunny. Um, like my nephew Hudson, uh, check out this picture. He is a little bit afraid of the Easter bunny, so my sister needs to start telling him right now, we're going to go see a giant man in a scary suit, but it'll be fine. But man, Easter is just right around the corner. And for some reason, there's just been this verse uh, that has just been ringing in my ears um, where it says in Luke chapter 9, it says, as the time approached for him, for Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. You know, I love the way that the message version puts it where it says, he gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to Jerusalem. See, Jerusalem, man, for Jesus... Like, it represented the place that he should not have wanted to go. You know, Jerusalem represented hardship. Jerusalem represented something that he didn't want to face. Jerusalem represented his end. It represented death. And yet he resolutely gathered up his courage, steeled himself for the journey. And it's only because he set his eyes towards death, man, that we could have life. And that's what we celebrate in this Easter season. And let's be clear, like this was not an easy journey for Jesus. And man, the journey that he invites us on as his followers, man, it isn't always easy either. Because when Jesus said, follow me, man, he was saying, follow me to the dead places in your life. Follow me to the hard places. Follow me to the areas that you don't want to go. And man, just like Jesus broke the cycles of sin and shame, when we follow after him, man, there are some cycles in our lives that he just wants to break as well. And so I want to spend a little bit of time uh, today just talking about what it means and what it looks like to be a cycle breaker. I mean, there are just some broken cycles, man, that we all get caught in, that we've gotten stuck in, and it's time that we set our face resolutely towards those, that we steal up our courage, that we face the journey, and we follow along with Jesus as he leads us into areas in our own lives that we don't want to go. And I kind of got the idea um, for this talk that we're going to walk through today um, from those progressive Becoming Your Parents commercials. Haven't you guys ever seen those? You know, they star Dr. Rick as he helps new home buyers that are slowly starting to become their parents. Uh, some of my favorite lines from these commercials are, do we really need another sign that says live, laugh, love? The answer is no. Uh, or how about, guess what? The waiter doesn't need to know your name. Or don't say howdy, you're not a cowboy. Or if there's no place to sit, there's too many pillows on your couch. I mean, have you ever said something or did something and then you like, step back and you're like, oh my goodness, 
I sounded just like my mom right there. Or like, my dad is the only other person that I know who does that. Have you ever had one of those moments before? Uh, My dad, whenever I was in high school, every Saturday morning, he would barge into my room and he would wake me up singing, rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. And as a high school boy, I was like, yo, the only thing I want to do is rise and shine and give you some of this glory. Like that is not how you wake up a high school dude. But my dad would always go around the house and he would do that thing where he'd be singing a tune, singing a song, and he would combine the lyrics to two or three songs or he would just make up his own song. And there has been more than one occasion where I'll be in my kitchen singing a song and my wife daily will walk up and be like, that's not how it goes. And I'm like, but that's how my dad sang it. So I think that's how it goes. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, And I actually recently became a dad uh, about eight months ago. My wife and I daily, we had our first daughter, Henley Ray Hunt. Um, This is my wife and my daughter. They're pretty cute. I don't know. That's pretty good. Uh, But whenever we had our daughter, Henley, um, we've kind of gotten into some different roles, gotten into a groove. And when it comes time to get Henley ready for bed, my job is to get her in the bath. And so I don't know when I started doing this. I don't know why I started doing this. But somewhere a couple weeks into fatherhood, whenever it was time to get Henley ready for the bath, I started rewriting the lyrics of songs to be about bath time. Like, I don't know if you know the song, I'll Make a Man Out of You from Mulan. But let's get down for bath time. We'll get you clean. We'll wash your nose, your toes, and everywhere in between. I mean, I've never even seen Mulan. Like, I don't even know how I can know that. Or do you remember the latest Hunger Games movie? Have any of you guys seen that movie? Um, There's this song in there called The Hanging Tree. And my wife, Daly, thinks this is so morbid, so gross that I started singing this song. But are you, are you ready for a bath? It won't last too long unless you splish and splash. We will get you clean. We'll get you squeaky clean because we'll wash your nose in all ten of your toes. I mean, who does that? What kind of weirdo, psycho, creepy guy would sing something like that to their kid at bath time? My dad would, that's who, and me. I mean, there are just some things that we've all caught from our families. Like genetically speaking, there is just some stuff in our DNA that gets passed down. I mean, I have my dad's nose and my dad's build. Uh, My daughter, Henley, she has my wife's lips and my wife's looks, and she has my red hair, so... I've always had this fear that I would have a bunch of red-headed kids and we'd look like the Weasleys from Harry Potter, but I guess that's just my fate and I'm going to have to accept it. But I mean, outside of like surgery, Botox, Rogaine, hair dye, like there is not much we can do about our physical features that we've caught from our families. However, like there are some other things that we've all caught, man, that we can change. You know, there are just some ways of thinking some habits or behaviors, ways that we see and treat other people, ways that we deal with conflict or hard emotions, or the fact that we don't deal with conflict or hard emotions. Like, there are just some things that maybe we were never explicitly taught from our families, but we just kind of unintentionally caught. And man, it's time to unlearn some of those things. You know, and maybe these are some things that we caught from our families, or maybe it was our buddies on the ball field, the guys in the locker room, our coworkers at the water cooler. You know, maybe there's some stuff that we just kind of picked up on the job site, at the nail salon, the hallways at school, our time in college, from online, from our favorite movies or TV shows, from a roommate, a teacher, a coach, a boss, a mentor, a neighbor. And there are even some things that we've picked up from church, man, that we just need to unlearn as well. And let me be clear, like today when we're talking through this, this is not a talk about blaming or bashing. We're not trashing our family heritage or throwing shade on our family trees. Like instead today, man, we're just going to take an honest look at ourselves. We're going to point the finger inward and do some interior examination. I mean, have you ever been driving along in your car when all of a sudden you hear like a screeching or a thudding, a banging or a bashing, and you're like, oh man, that does not sound good. I mean, okay, and you can be honest, this is a safe space. How many of you have ever thought, like, I do not have the time, the money, attention, or the skills to fix this right now? So you just kind of lean forward, you know, you crank the radio up, or you roll the window down just to drown the noise out. Have any of you ever done that? Man, what we want to do today is we're just going to kind of turn down the noise. We want to pop open the hood of our hearts and our lives and do some interior examination. You know, August, or Socrates once said, the unexamined life is not worth living. St. Augustine said, oh God, let me know myself. Let me know you. And Ice Cube once said, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And man, we've all got some things that have been wrecking us. 
We're all caught in some deadly cycles that have been wrecking our lives, wrecking our families, wrecking our relationships. And so as we put our eyes on Easter, man, we are just going to let Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, man, the grand designer, this great, big, huge, wonderful, grand God that died on the cross for our sin, for those dead, broken cycles inside of us, man, we are going to let him lead us to some places where maybe we don't want to go. And we're going to say, man, with God's help, this cycle of unhealth, man, it stops with me. And so we're just going to kind of take a deep dive of looking at our families and how they've shaped our emotional health and how we see ourselves and our role in the world. And man, I've got to be honest, like I am so grateful uh, for my parents. You know, I grew up in Oklahoma and my parents really did work hard to pass down some good things to my sister and I. You know, they sacrificed, you know, job opportunities and promotions, more money, because they knew their whole life that their best investment was in us. And man, they gave me a good work ethic. They taught me to love fishing, being outside, loving sports and woodworking. They gave me a great sense of family. I mean, my parents, they were so involved in my life. They knew the name of every single one of my friends. Like my friends wanted to hang out at my house more than anybody else's because my parents knew them and were invested in them and loved them and cared for them so well. Like my parents, you know, instilled this deep sense and this love of God inside of me since I was a really young kid. I mean, the hardest part for me about living in California isn't the insane gas prices, although what a bummer. Like, it's not like the high cost of living, but man, it's being so far away from my family. But the truth is, there were some cycles of dysfunction. There were some cycles of unhealth that I caught from my family as well that I've had to work through. And I can guarantee you that one day my kids, they're going to catch some unhealthy cycles from me as well. I mean, I might as well start saving for Henley's counseling fund right now. Like, none of us come from perfect families. And in my family, man, there were just some ways of coping, seeing, reacting, thinking, and feeling that I've had to work on with God on changing. You know, there were some generational insecurities, some unhealthy communication tactics, ways that we dealt with anger, the fact that we numbed each other out and we would use the silent treatment on one another. We had a little bit of judgmentalism, some addictive tendencies and behaviors that, man, I have just tried to unlearn along the way. You know, and some of us today in the room or online, we might be thinking like, oh, great, we're talking about families. If you only knew the level of dysfunction in my family, like if you, knew, if you knew the stories that I have about the slam doors, the yelling matches, the arguments and the fights, you'd know that my family is less of a Dr. Rick feature and more of a Dr. Phil fiasco. Like nobody is turning our Ancestry.com story into this beautiful commercial of look at this family. It's more like, you know, a WWE highlight reel or like a wanted poster. But man, what I love about following Jesus And looking to God's word for wisdom and advice is that it isn't full of picture-perfect people, picture-perfect families, or picture-perfect family trees. Like, it's full of picture-perfect nothing except for a perfect God that is pursuing his people. And you can see, like, whenever you read through the story of the Bible, you'll see that Adam was a coward. Cain was a murderer. Noah was a drunk. Job was depressed. Abraham had trust issues. Isaac tried to ditch his wife. Jacob was a con man. Joseph was a jerk. Moses committed manslaughter. Joshua was anxious. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was codependent. Samuel was a cruddy dad. Samson was seduced. Saul was insecure. David stole his best friend's girl, slept with her, and then had his best friend murdered. Who does that? I mean, Absalom committed incest. Solomon was an addict. Jonah ran away. Hosea's wife left him. Daniel was imprisoned. Esther was abandoned. John the Baptist was just a weirdo. Like Thomas was filled with doubt. Peter was a hothead. Matthew stole from his grandma. Paul was filled with bloodlust. And Judas, I mean, need I say more? Judas was a hater and a traitor. I mean, if your family has some issues, Welcome to Cal Church. Like, that's, like, for a lot of us, that list doesn't sound like a list of Bible characters. It sounds like a list of our cousins at Christmas. But man, there really is hope for every single one of us. And there are hope for our families. You know, last summer, I read this fantastic book uh, called The Deeply Formed Life by a pastor named Rich Velotis. And man, this book is excellent. Like, it's like $15.99 on Amazon. It is totally worth the cost. You should get it and read it. A lot of what we're going to talk through today is either heavily influenced from this book or, man, it's just like directly taken from it. Uh, but in this book, Rich Velotis talks about how there are three things, um, three things that when we don't know how they play and affect in our lives, like three things that we've picked up and learned from our fairly, families of origin— when they stay unidentified, man, these three things can just take us out. And so the three categories we want to keep in mind is patterns, traumas, and scripts. Like three things that create this unhealthy, deadly cycle when we don't know them. 
and that can lead us to death. And so the first one is patterns. And when we talk about patterns, what we have in mind is like the repeated behavior, practices, habits, or ways of thinking that extend from one generation to the next. I mean, have you ever said something to your daughter and you stood back and you're like, oh my goodness, my mom said the exact same thing to me whenever I was her age. Uh, or, you know, have you ever been at work and you tell a joke and you just get eye rolls in response and you kind of lean back and you think, when does like a normal joke become a dad joke? When they're full grown, that's when. I'm sorry, that's a bad dad joke right there. And I mean, a lot of us, you know, we have some good patterns that our family passed down. You know, maybe how we manage money, a love for music in the outdoors, you know, our sense of family, our sense of self. You know, maybe a lot of us in the room and online, man, we're probably here today because we had a grandma that prayed for us and passed down her faith to us. But man, we've also got some negative patterns that have been passed down as well. You know, some of us, the things we struggle with, the way that we see other people, the way that we cope with pain, how we internalize rejection, the way that we define success, our overeating, our overworking, our overdrinking, our inability to identify our emotions or admit when we're wrong, our negative self-talk, that negative view of our own body, the fact when we look into the mirror, we hate the person looking back every single time. Man, chances are those things, those things could have gotten passed down to us by our parents. And man, chances are, our parents' parents might have struggled with some of those things as well. And our parents' parents' parents might have struggled with those as well. You know, Rich Belota says, Jesus might live in your heart, but grandpa lives in your bones. And he's saying, we're all built, we're all structured by the influence of our families. And plus, if you think about our family influence, and it gets even more complex based on our religious upbringing or our cultural or ethnic surroundings. I mean, we might have been told growing up, like, that's just the way we do things. You know, for instance, in some cultures, to show any sign of fear is to communicate a weakness. And so it's communicated. Don't cry out loud. Keep it inside. Learn how to hide your feelings. You know, in other cultures, to express anger is frowned upon. To question somebody who is older than you is something that you never do. In some churches, man, to show outward grief is a sign that you lack faith. And so consequently, man, many of us, we learn to avoid rationalize away, or repress difficult feelings. And Rich Belota says emotions don't die. They just get redirected in a myriad of dangerous ways. And if we don't identify the patterns that we've been handed, the patterns that we've caught, the cycles that we're stuck in, man, chances are we'll relive those things. And we'll become the exact same kind of dad. The exact same mom, the same husband, the same wife, the same spouse, the same parent, the same person that we saw in our parents that we swore that we never wanted to be anything like. Man, and then we're going to pass some of those things down to our kids as well, and we're going to redirect those negative emotions on them. But man, if we can learn to identify, man, the patterns that we've been handed, man, that's a great way to pop the hood of our heart and for the lights to start come, to come on, man, as we follow after Jesus to the places where we don't want to go. So we have patterns, and then we come to trauma. And when we talk about trauma, uh, I kind of have two sides of the same coin in mind. See, trauma is what, trauma is what I, getting what I didn't deserve, and it's not getting what I did deserve. And man, many of us, like we've experienced some things that we just didn't deserve. You know, abuse, whether physically, emotionally, verbally, maybe even sexually. You know, we've had painful seasons of prolonged hardship, unexpected death, unbearable loss, divorce, bankruptcy, infertility, and these are some painful and scarring seasons that we've had to walk through, man, and it leaves a mark on us. And man, some of us, like we didn't get what we did deserve. You know, maybe we had parents that were always around, but they weren't really involved. And we didn't always get the unconditional love, the words of affirmation, the warmth, the affection that we needed to flourish. And oh sure, from the outside looking in, it looked like we were the leave it to beavers. We had everything figured out. We were this picture perfect family. But man, on the inside, man, our family was floundering and we just swept it under the rug. I mean, for some of us, maybe the dysfunction, the trauma in our home was so normalized that we have a hard time even identifying it as trauma. But we've all got some wounds. 
Uh, have any of you guys ever been to the Redwood Forest up in Northern California? Anybody ever been there? Man, I want to go someday to see these great big huge forests of trees. I mean, these are some of these trees, they can be up to 2,000 years old, and they can grow to be about 300 feet in the sky. The largest wed- redwood tree right now, it is 379 feet tall. But did you know that if you took one of these great big huge trees and you cut it in half, you would see an inside, you'd see a bunch of rings. And this inside, these rings would tell a story about the tree that you would never be able to see, never be able to identify from looking at the outside. And so you'd come and you'd see one ring that would represent a year of drought where the, the tree didn't have much growth. You'd see another ring, you know, where there was a year of like a ton of rainfall and the tree grew a lot. You'd see another ring that represented, um, you know, a year where maybe the tree got struck by lightning. Uh, you'd see another ring that represented, you know, maybe a year whenever the tree got struck by one of your stray golf balls. Um, but like these, these rings on the inside, they tell a story that from looking on the outside, man, you would never be able to see. And could you imagine, like if we could cut ourselves open in a non-morbid way, of course, and look at the rings on the inside of us, and the kind of story that it would tell? I mean, maybe there's a ring that made you feel like you could never live up to your older brother. You know, you were only accepted if you could catch the ball, run faster, jump higher, shoot better, get better grades, and you felt like you could never live up to him, so you felt like you were never accepted by your dad. You know, maybe there's a ring that shows the time you were walking through the halls when that kid came up to you and said something so cruel, and those hate-filled words, you know, ring through your ears, ring through your mind all these years, even though it's been, you know, since high school. You know, maybe there's a ring from when your dad walked out. You know, maybe there's a ring that shows fresh dirt being thrown over the casket of the person that you love most in the world. You know, maybe there's a ring from the absence of hearing words or of never hearing words like I love you or I'm proud of you. You know, maybe there's a ring that shows a spouse closing a door for the last time in two years, five years, ten years, twenty years of marriage is just over. Man, maybe there's a ring when a family member or friend, you know, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, someone that you loved, someone that you trusted, someone that was supposed to be a safe person, man, they hit you, they hurt you, they abused you, they touched you in a way that they had no right to do. You know, maybe there's a ring that would show a season where that eating disorder just ruled your life and you felt like you had to shove your fingers down your throat in order to be thin and then you would finally fit in. You know, maybe there's a ring that shows how you were belittled when you revealed your true feelings and you were told to never cry. And then these rings inside, if we don't work through them, if we don't deal with them, if we don't face them, this trauma that we've suffered, man, it will build up walls around us. I mean, you got any rings? You got any wounds? Is there any trauma in your past that you've tried to forget, tried to ignore, tried to shove away? But the truth is, man, we feel the effects of those things every single day. You know, Brene Brown once said, if we don't own our story, man, our story ends up owning us. See, the truth is, we usually either try to dwell on our pain or we try to deny it. We dwell on it. We think it's a faithful friend, a close companion. We think about it every single day. Or we try to deny it. We try to put our past behind us, never face it. We ignore it. We try to just shove it in the back. And then our enemy loves for us to go back and forth on this pendulum where we dwell, deny, dwell, deny. But man, God has a different way. A way where we don't dwell on the pain. A way where we don't deny the pain, but instead where we deal with the pain. You know, American novelist James Baldwin says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Hey man, let me be clear, this is some hard stuff. See, a lot of times we like to Christianize what it means to take up our cross and follow after Jesus. But it means that we set our face resolutely to the broken places inside, the places that feel like hardship, the places that we don't want to go. It means we gather up the courage to face the brokenness in our path, in our past, that we steal ourselves for the journey to face the trauma that we've suffered. Because if we don't, man, if we don't pull over our car, if we don't pop the hood, man, it is only going to get worse. And if we don't identify recognize, and invite God to bring healing into our trauma, man, that pain has a way of metastasizing and affecting all of our other relationships. See, we've got patterns, we've got trauma, and then the last one is we've got scripts. And scripts are just the messages we receive about the role that we were handed to play in our family. 
You know, these are the rules that were either consciously handed to us or unconsciously interpreted by us. You know, maybe from a young age, you thought, I have to hold everything in this family together, and you found out that your role was to be the glue. You know, or maybe your job was to keep the peace, and you had parents, you know, who couldn't communicate well to each other, so you felt like you had to get in the middle of their marriage, and you had to be the peacemaker. You had to be the mediator. You know, maybe you had a script that was handed to you, said that your job was to be the kid that didn't have any needs because your older brother, your older sister, your younger sibling, you know, they were the one that had all the needs. So you need to be the good kid that didn't need anything. You know, maybe you were supposed to be the protector or the provider to fill the hole that was left by your dad. You know, our scripts could read something like the perfectionist, the nurturer, the critic, the problem child, the daughter that's too much, the overachiever, the good kid, the loser, the victim. And I mean, no actual script was actually handed to us. But man, early on in my family, I learned that my role was to be the achiever. I was supposed to be the good kid that got good grades, that was in honors classes, and my worth got attached to what I did. I mean, that has been a script that has marked my life as a leader, a friend, a husband, a son, a dad, and even as a pastor. I mean, it's only when I identify these cycles, these patterns, trauma, and scripts that were passed down to me that I can start to become a cycle breaker, and I can invite God in to do some major overhaul work in, inside of my heart and inside my life. It's only when I recognize what I've caught that I can start to replace what I was unintentionally taught. You know, this year I made a couple of New Year's resolutions. Anybody else make a New Year's resolution back in January? How you doing on those? Sorry, I won't ask. You know, that's better. Uh, but one of the New Year's resolutions that I made this year was actually to read uh, less of the Bible. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, why is this guy on stage? Like, why did, what in the world? What kind of pastor guy says that? Um, others of you, you're just jealous that you didn't think of that being your New Year's resolution. Um, but man, what I mean by that is like this year, like I've just decided there's a couple of verses that I want to like drop anchor in. Like there are just some scriptures that I want to let, I want to sit and soak in, that I want to let, you know, more of God's word get into me, into my heart, my mind, my soul. I want to let it take over my patterns, my scripts and traumas. I want to replace what I was handed with God's word and the power that is found there. And so one of those uh, is Psalm 139. And if you've never checked out uh, the Psalms before, Man, they are this great place uh, where the writers, you know, they have emotional honesty. They get real and raw. They pull out anger and angst, worry and frustration. Uh, but it begins in, in Psalm 139, and it says this. It says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Man, David is saying, God, you know everything in me. You know the patterns I'm playing out, the trauma I received, the scripts I'm living. You know the cycles that I'm stuck in, the cycles that are broken. God, you know the good, the bad, the ugly, and the really stinking ugly in me. And I am so grateful. I have to hide in all of my other relationships. But God, I don't have to hide with you. I can be my real, authentic, vulnerable self because God, you know me and you see me. And then he goes on and he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. David isn't saying like, dang God, your 24-7 surveillance van is kind of creepy. Like, he's not like Michael Jackson, how come it feels like somebody's watching me? No, he's saying, God, I know that you were always present to me. I know you were always with me. You know, I can skip out on other people. I can stay home from work. I can dodge, dip, duck, dive, and dodge friends and relationships. You know, I can shake and bake my friends. But God, I cannot get away from you. God, you are always with me. And knowing that I'm always in your presence, man, it doesn't scare me. It gives me such a sense of security because you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. He's saying, God, you know me. You see me. You created me. I may be unwanted by my family, but man, I am wanted by you. I may be unwanted by the world, but God, I am wanted by you. I may be rejected by my friends, but God, I am wanted by you. And your love for me, it is so great. It is so grand. It is so huge. It is so vast and high and deep and wide. God, your love is so scandalous and it pursues me and it gives me confidence that I can face anything that gets in my way, anything that life throws at me, anything that feels too big. God, I can face it even if that thing is me. See, this verse has been about God's intimate knowledge of David. And then David lands his prayer by saying, God, you know everything about me, but I don't know everything about me. So God, will you 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Man, David's just saying, God, will you help me examine my rings? God, will you help me to break the cycles that I'm stuck in? Lord, will you show me, me? Will you give me an awareness of myself so that way I can get more of you in me? See, we've got to examine our rings, our patterns, our trauma, our scripts. We've got to examine those things with God. We've got to ask God to show us and reveal those things to us. Like where we pray, God, will you reveal what only you can reveal so that way you can heal what only you can heal? Like that's the prayer of a cycle breaker. To wake up and say, search me, oh God. Help me to know myself better so I can know you better. Man, if we want to be a cycle breaker, like we've got to examine our rings, our patterns and traumas and scripts with God, but we've also got to do it with others. You know, something else that I learned about those great big redwood trees um, that just kind of blew my mind, that tower, you know, hundreds of feet in the sky. Did you know that they're actually held together by a system of roots that are only about one inch in diameter, and they only go five or six feet deep in the soil? But instead, these roots, they actually spread out 50, 80, 100 feet wide, and they get all interconnected and intertwined beneath the root systems of the other trees. And it's this system of connectedness below the surface that makes these giant redwood forests able to withstand storms, wind. The Santa Anas can't even blow these things over. It's only because they're connected below the surface with each other, man, that they can stand tall. You think there's a message in there for us? I mean, man, if we've learned anything over the past couple years, it's that we need one another. Like, we were not created to do life alone. And if we want to become a cycle breaker, man, we have to do it with God and with other people. You know, and that's why I'm so excited for Easter at Cow Church. Like, man, what a great opportunity to jump back into community and to invite some of our friends, family members, coworkers, you know, people in our neighborhood to do the exact same thing, where they can come in and hear about the hope that we have in Jesus, the hope that changes everything about our world and our lives. And I think today uh, you're going to get some invites um, on your way out. But man, take a stack of them and invite people from all around your world, like everyone that you know, to come with you to an Easter service at Cow Church to hear about the hope that we have in Jesus. Because to be a cycle breaker, we have to get our roots down deep into God's love, deep into who he says we are, and then we've got to let our roots go wide and walk with one another. See, man, when the first Easter was right around the corner, you know, Jesus set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem. He gathered up his courage, steeled himself for the journey, and he experienced death so that we could experience life. You know, the empty tomb broke the cycles of sin and shame that humanity has been stuck in, and now we get to follow after him and experience freedom and forgiveness and life to the full. So how about it? And are you ready to become a cycle breaker? Are you ready to experience the life that God has for us? Are you ready to face the broken things that we've all got inside of us so that way we can experience the real, true, full life that Jesus came to offer? See, man, following Jesus isn't always easy. Following him as he says, take up your cross and follow me, man, it's not always a pleasant path, but man, it's always better. And there really is hope for every single one of us to be a cycle breaker. Uh, Let's pray real quick. God, we just thank you. God, we just thank you that you love us and that you care for us. And man, God, I know whenever we talk, um, you know, about our family and some of the cycles that we've been stuck in and our trauma and our wounds, man, God, for a lot of us, you know, this is some stuff that we've tried to avoid. God, this is stuff we've tried to shove in our past, God, that we've tried to put behind us. And so, God, I just pray that you would help us today. God, would you reveal what only you can reveal? God, so that you can bring healing to what only you can heal. God, would you help us to identify what we've been handed? God, identify the broken cycles that we're stuck in. God, so that we can replace those with the truth of your word. God, with the truth of what you say about us. And man, God, as Easter is right around the corner, God, we are just so grateful. Man, for those cycles that you broke. God, that that empty tomb, you know, defeated death. It defeated condemnation. It defeated sin. God, so that way we could follow after you and experience life to the full. God, we are just so grateful for Jesus. And it's in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.